thank you again, everyone. And I really enjoyed uh, some of the talks. I couldn't make the earlier one, but I really enjoyed the last talk by Daniel. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, non-human primate stem cell models and how we utilize them for in vivo organ generation. Um, as the topic of this seminar today is focusing on in vivo models. Okay. Um, a little bit of the uh, history about what uh, iPS induced pluripotent stem cells are, and probably um, a lot of you know already. A lot of you already know that, but the earliest. Um, discovery of iPSC induced pluripotent stem cells was done by Yamanaka in the year 2007, 2006 and seven that he was able to show that we can take a blood cell or skin cell, any somatic cell and reprogram them back to how they are actually in day five of the embryo. The panel on top shows that in day five of embryo, we have this clump of cells called embryonic stem cells, which comes from the inner cell mass. And it was quite a groundbreaking research that showing that we can go back in time. And um, of course, doing so, we are the cells are losing their epigenetic memory. Now, the question is that what are the applications of such research? So. In order to better understand what we're going to talk about today, I am um, giving a little bit of history. The first embryonic cell stem cells were derived from actually a rhesus macaque embryo in mid 90s. And this was done, done by Jamie Thompson in Wisconsin. They, um, they took this clump of cells, as you see on the right, and the cartoon also shows the clump of red cells. They took this and removed the the layer around the trophic, so-called tro trophoblast, and then plated that, and were able to proliferate and expand, propagate this cell type. This was the first line of embryonic stem cells. And then later on, it was done on human embryo, five-day embryo. But as you could say, there was a challenge in every time you're deriving an embryonic stem cell, you're killing an embryo. And this was ethically not acceptable by at the time by federal government and a lot of oppositions. But um, then when the IPSC method, as I mentioned, was developed, they were able to inject um, a research started that we inject the uh, and use pluripotent stem cells of one species into the embryo of another species. And what does that create? It will create a cross-species chimera. And you can imagine if you inject iPSCs induced pluripotent cells, stem cells derived from the black, mi black mice into the five-day blastocyst of a rat, you can generate a cross-species chimera of mouse and rat, which composed of the cell types from both species. Now, this is an interesting work, but what's the clinical application of that? So, the idea was that if we can knock out one single gene, PDX1, in a rat, as you see in the cartoon, the the, the red rat here, um, and if you inject the mouse iPSCs, stem cells that are in naive form, into the blastocyst of this PDX1 knockout rat, you can form the interspecies cell combination, form the chimera as you saw the real chimeras that the pictures I showed you in the previous slide. And you can, the injected cells of mouse form a pancreas inside the, the rat. The PDX1 knockout rat develops no pancreas, but now with injection of the mouse iPSCs, you can create a personalized pancreas that are derived from the mouse stem cells. So this is quite interesting that you could transplant this pancreas that you generated in this rat incubator, if you wish, and uh, and cure diabetes. So there is a great hope for generation of organs in an animal if we can do that 
for other species as well. This actually, this work has been done in 2010 and 2017 generation of mouse rat, mouse pancreas in a rat using iPSC and rat pancreas in the mouse using iPSC uh, by um, Nakauchi group. So this rodent experiment opened the possibility. Can we do that with humans? Can we generate human iPSC and inject that in another species and generate personal human organ inside, let's say, a pig? And this is different from transplanting a pig pancreas into human. You're just creating a niche, a pancreatic embryo of pig and injecting a patient's iPSC into the embryo and technically growing a personalized organ of the of the patient inside the pig. And if friendly, you can transplant it back into the patient that needs it, let's say pancreas, pancreatic transplant. But the point on my slide is that this is not working so far. And the reason is that evolutionary distance between human and pig is uh, way more than the evolutionary distance between mouse and rat, number one. And the, the second problem is that the primate iPSCs, including human, they are not in their naive state. And it's still challenging to make good quality stem cells that can engraft in a, a different species embryo. What we did is started working on a non-human primate stem cell model. The reason we avoided working on human stem cell because of ethical challenges of injecting human cells into other species. So the, the design we did, I'm, I'm skipping all the work that we did in how we worked on non-human primates stem cells to make naive stem cells. And um, we also improved the culture condition. I'm skipping all those steps. And uh, to be able to make feeder-free non-human primate stem cells and making the cells in both form of naive stem cells, which are dome-shaped and the prime uh, stem cell. Now a review of what we were talking about, on, on top you could inject the rat stem cell into the embryo of a mouse or vice versa and create mouse rat chimera. Now the question is the whole field of organ generation is on um, waiting to see if we can recapitulate this mouse rat experiment between human and a closely related species. Of course, you can imagine that injection of a human stem cell into rhesus macaque embryo is ethically somewhat challenging. We don't know what we are getting and we don't wanna create uh, that such chimera, but how could we answer this scientific question without crossing ethical boundaries? So, that the study we designed is to take the chimpanzee iPSCs, make the good quality chimpanzee iPSC as a surrogate for human and inject them into the rhesus macaque blastocyst to recapitulate mouse rat experiment. And you could see here, we, in terms of evolutionary distance, the chimpanzee and macaque, rhesus macaque have about 25 million years evolutionary distance and same, approximately similar to what the evolutionary distance has uh, between uh, mouse and rat. As you see between mouse and rat, we have successful rodent cross-species chimera. Here the question is that uh, can non-human primate cross-species, can we make non-human cross-species chimera utilizing iPSCs, which paves the path for future organ generation? So showing this slide again, this is actually the injection of chimpanzee iPSCs that we derive from the blood of a chimpanzee into the blastocyst of a rhesus macaque, which unfortunately didn't form viable chimeric blastocysts. The next step we were thinking about, so let's make these iPSCs as close as to this inner cell mass, because the goal is to make these cells mingle. And combined together, how we can mimic the profiles, transcriptome profile of these two cells as close as possible to have a viable chimeric. So we did um, transcriptome profiling of rhesus macaque blastocyst and also chimpanzee iPSCs. In a parallel work we did of rhesus macaque blastocyst and um, inner cell mass, we, in this, this experiment, 
we remove the zona placida and the troph trophoblast, and we only use the inner cell mass because that's the part that forms different body. And the goal is to make these two compatible. We saw several genes that are highly expressed in, in the inner cell mass of this rhesus macaque blastocyst compared to, compared to the donor cells, which are the chimpanzee or pigtail macaque iPSC. So we use this transcriptome profile to improve the quality of the naive stem cells in the chimpanzee. And uh, we labeled the cells with TD tomato uh, to be able to track them. And we found that several genes, including BACL2, are over, overly expressed in, in the early embryo of rhesus macaque. And we utilized those profiles that we saw in the early embryo and injected the, the product of the modified cells of chimpanzee into rhesus macaque blastocyst. We noticed that this time, the red cells of chimpanzee injected into the blastocyst of the rhesus macaque have successfully survived and proliferated in the, in the host rhesus macaque blastocyst. So this is like a 20, 48 hour image of the chimpanzee stem cells injected into the rhesus macaque blastocyst. As you could see the red chimpanzee stem cells expanding over time and the more interesting part that I would like to draw your attention to is that the red the red cells aggregate around the inner cell mass mostly of the of the host um, blastocyst, which is rhesus macaque. So we repeated this over like on uh, 103 rhesus macaque embryos. We we could be confident that the cells are viable and proliferate inside the host, which is rhesus macaque, and try move towards forming viable chimera. One question that we, we have not yet transplanted these embryos into surrogate monkey because of some ethical challenges, but there is a promising work uh, work that we this could move forward and we are uh, working on um, some protocols that we are able to be able to see whether or not scientifically we could address this question. But as you, as I mentioned, we didn't use human stem cells. We used chimpanzee iPSC. But one question is that how compatible human and chimpanzee stem cells are? How, how can we trust that chimpanzee cells can recapitulate human cells in this experiment that we designed? Because our goal is not to create chimpanzee organs, at least for the long term. But we designed this experiment, co-culturing human and chimpanzee iPSCs from the method, improved method that we created. As you see, the green human iPSCs with the red labeled chimpanzee iPSCs, and also we use the control of human red and another line of human cells in green. As you see, the, the colony of the cells formed salt and pepper mixture of the colony. When we do the similar experiment with mouse and human, we see that they have two segregated colony. The human and mouse, of course, evolutionarily are far apart and they don't form this salt and pepper combination of colonies. So this was interesting that chimpanzee and I, human iPSC are very compatible, at least when they physically are cultured and they don't form segregated colonies. But is this functional? We The next step, we took this mixture of human and chimpanzee colonies of stem cells and we differentiated them to cardiomyocyte. Interestingly, we found that the human and chimpanzee mixture started forming beating cardiomyocyte layers, although they are composed of both human and chimpanzee stem cells, which was showing somewhat validating that uh, the human and chimpanzee cells are compatible. At least we can trust that this is a good surrogate for the lines of chimpanzee that we have. This was uh, created some interest in, in scientific community when we released the preprint uh, covered in science and people were excited about like, maybe this opens the door for generation of in vivo organs in other species 
from human cells, which could be done in personalized manner but, and reduce the chance of um, organ generation failure that is mostly done because of incompatibility of immune system between the patient's organ donor. But this time it's going to be personalized. And of course, it's still a lot of work to do, but this is, paves the path. So I want to switch gear how much uh, I think we still have some time uh, to to explain that what we are trying to do to to move this work forward is to better understand the early embryonic stages of the host and what are the molecular changes happens in that to be able to successfully generate um, uh, human organs within a host species. And um, what we recently did to study dynamics of coding genes and non-coding elements and I remember during this fireside uh, chat from Jennifer mentioning that this long coding RNA, non coding RNA are an interesting area. And we, that's the main area that we are focusing on right now in these early stages of embryo. In general, what we find, I'm going to summarize what we have found is that the, as the embryo develops from day zero to day five, the gene coding uh, regions of the genes, the genome is. Um, the expression increases. And on the other hand, the non-coding region activity decreases over time. It's very interesting that these non-coding regions of the genome is more active in the early stages of embryo, and it slows down as the embryo develops. We did develop a long read tool method to study these one cell, two cell, four cell, which was a bit challenging. We could validate that this is quite happening in terms of total expression and the count of the uh, elements of non-coding region, the genome. To further investigate, we took different classes of non-coding, including lines and signs and uh, uh, other el repeat elements. And we saw this pattern quite exist in from day zero to two cell, four cell, and going down to blastocyst. So, in general, this is the pattern, what we found in terms of the uh, the coding genes and the non-coding regions of the genome from day one of the embryo development to day five. And of course, this we looked at the transcription factors that are most active in day one of embryo formation and what, uh, what classes they are. Interestingly, we found that this is this makes total sense that a lot of the genes that are active in the early on are uh, not related to transcription, which matches with the profile we found that, of course, we have a lot of negative regulator of PAL2 in the earliest stages of embryo. And as embryo, is, as embryo develops to day five, um, the PAL2 has become more active. And we, we listed about 32 that most of them are negative regulator of PAL2, which was matches the biology that we so far we expected. So I don't want to dig into more details about this because of the limitation of time, but just wanted to give you a, a short view of what is possible to do utilizing the non-human primate model. And is is there hope that we could we could use non-human primate model and stem cell models that we have in the primate for organ generations in vivo in a personalized manner for human. Of course, the first step is to be successful to generate that for. And the challenges are still valid in terms of the quality iPSCs that are generated for, um, for human, and there are limited options to validate that in vivo, which we try to do with utilizing chimpanzee cells here. And um, I believe that the deep profiling of the host embryo would open, will open doors for, for future applications of chimeric work and possibly generation of the personalized organs utilizing human stem cells. And I would happy to thank you, uh, the, all the collaborators, including um, at Stanford and Johns Hopkins University and the Snyder Lab, which was the main group that I've been affiliated with over the last several years. Happy to take questions. Thank you.